in our in our celebration, you know, uh, we decided to watch The West Wing, which the- I had never seen a single episode of. Me neither. But and- me and Matt are experts. I, yeah, we, every episode, motherfuckers, woo. all the way. Even the last season with no Sorkin. I also have a history with the West Wing. Uh, the, the, you know, I think we, we should talk about each of you know the fact that some of us are coming into it completely unsullied. Some of us have an embarrassing former affiliation with this show, but it was sort of like kismet because it's we were figured. Well, let's do a show about the West Wing. We got to talk about this show. It's 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 the fucking Rosetta Stone for everything stupid about what contemporary contemporary liberals currently believe as Uh, i said on the last episode before the harvard one sorkin has done more to damage america's political imagination than anyone since dw griffith (laughs) and you you were at that was 100 percent prophetic and right but also like the kismet was as it turned out uh current affairs had a great article this week on just this topic by luke savage i wish i had known about this earlier but it's a really good piece titled how liberals fell in love with the West Wing. Aaron Sorkin's political drama shows everything wrong with the democratic worldview. And man, oh man, rewatching that show, holy shit, does it hold up everything <laughs> wrong with the democratic worldview? And it was sort of like, you know, I th- this show first came on TV in 1999, and it's sort of twilight of the Clinton years, and then transitioned into the George W. Bush administration. And I remember when this show was first on TV. I loved it. It was appointment viewing with my with my mom and dad. It was like family TV time, watching the West Wing. And then George Bush became president, and I, I lost, like, I, I just, I stopped watching the show because I was like, I, I some part of me was just like, this is liberal fantasia. We can't live. We can't delude ourselves in this A world A little girl anymore. has lost her faith in democracy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we can't, I can't keep lying to myself that, like, people I like are in charge. That was the right instinct, but it was wrong on a number of levels because I still believed that the characters on the West Wing were good people. Right. Luckily, some 20 years, almost 20 years later, those scales have completely fallen from my eyes. I think that's a typical uh, journey that a lot of people maybe similar minded to us make where they were, when they were younger, they thought it was real. And then that kind of went away, but they still thought it should be real. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. that eventually goes away, too. That's it shouldn't be like that. It's like how people feel about porn. <laughs> if you're 20, you know, 26, 27, and you think porn is real and not CGI, grow <laughs> up. But Will's history with the West Wing is kind of like Judd Hirsch in The Breakfast Club. You know what I got on Christmas? We had to watch two cathedrals. <laughs> 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 no, but I, had, I had a similar experience. My grandmother loved the West Wing because she was a, um, I guess, Fournier-style liberal Democrat in some ways. And she gave me a box set for my birthday. I think when it was like 13, 14. And I stopped playing uh, Snake Eater long enough to put the DVDs in my PS2. And because I was 14, which is the perfect age to be a lib, I was like, oh, if only we had a president like that. I mean, I was like, oh, I wish I wasn't, you know, nine when Bill Clinton was president. But then you get older and you're like, well, if he was... If this was true to the Clinton years, Bartlett would be constantly committing sexual assaults. I mean, it's not one to one with the Clinton administration. If anything, I think I don't want to talk about the the Bartlett administration as portrayed on the West Wing per, is much more the Obama administration than yeah. the Clinton one. And I think what's interesting is that, okay, like I said, it happened. It sort of like became really popular at the end of the Clinton administration and sort of carried on over into the Bush administration in the early aughts and twenty first century. And I think. If, like the people who watched that show and like didn't become disillusioned with the, the this fantasy of having you know these nice technocratic liberals in charge definitely took it to heart and this is one thing I want to bring up in uh, Luke Savage's piece I want to actually just quote from it right here while certainly appealing to a general audience thanks to its expensive sheen and distinctive writing the West Wing's greatest zealots have proven to be those who professionally inhabit the very milieu it depicts. Washington political staffers, media types, centrist cognoscenti, and various others drawn from the ranks of people who tweet big if true in earnest and think that a lanyard is a talisman that grants wishes and wards off evil. I think that uh, the big if true thing, I mean, this is a great article by Luke Savage, but I think the big if true thing really sticks with me because if you noticed, uh, the people that he alluded to, the Beltway Insiders, the lanyards, 
they now talk like Sorkin characters. The farther they get from p- power, the more they delve into fantasy and try to pick up this sort of fucking pithy banter. This yeah. professional, I, s- I know everything. I'm sorry, I still know, think it's not- like porn. Like the first stage is you think this is what sex actually is. Yeah. And the second stage uh, is like, oh, sex isn't like that, but it should be like that. <laughs> and then you grow up. Right. But these yeah. people have not grown up, and they're still like, "Why don't women fuck me like in the West Wing?" Yeah. Bart, Bart, Bartlett. Do you is, understand my metaphor now? Yeah. No, no, now I, 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 I got totally it. Bar- 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 Bartlett is on the bank bus. <laughs> you son of a bitch! <laughs> Stopping watching the West Wing is like when I found out the bank bus isn't real. Yeah, yeah. See, now you yeah. get it. I'm doing serious literary analysis here. <laughs> we were Will ready. the bank bus is real? Everyone who picks up a girl in a parking lot <laughs> and fucks her in the backseat <laughs> is on the bank bus. However, like porn, the West Wing is still entertaining even though we know how bad it is, which right. is why we were stoned out of our minds watching it. Uh, me and Brendan, I think, for the first time, which was really, I think, the way to staggering. experience it. Really staggering. Me and, yeah. Bre- me and Brendan were both... Well, uh, you weren't high, which is so weird. I mean... Well, I was facing the horror even more stoic. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't either, but I had already been inured. You know, I'm like Banna. I grew up in the war. <laughs> seeing the West Wing. But you... You were you, your weird weed resistant brain. Had to <laughs> yeah. It was like seeing a war crime. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, other early fans of the show uh, that Savage also brings up are, of course, uh, perennial Chapo uh, guests and characters, uh, the Vox Boys, Matt Iglesias and Ezra Klein. Ooh. And uh, he quotes Ezra Klein in this article as saying, there's a cultural meme or cultural suggestion that Washington is boring, that policy is boring, but it's important stuff adding that the show dramatized the immediacy and urgency and concern that people in this town feel about the issues they're working on. I was interested in politics before the show started, added Iglesias, but a friend of mine from college moved to D.C. at the same time as me after graduation, and we definitely plotted our proposed domination of the Capitol in explicitly West Wing terms. Who is more like Toby? Who is more like Josh? Jesus fucking Christ! (laughs) Was there a? He's uh, literally. That show is literally why we have Ezra Klein running around in his fucking fedora. The idea is that, like, when I say that, like, th- this is you know sort of like a message from the future sent in the past. It's sort of like, if can you imagine the people who went after after the Bush administration, after going through eight years of having like a terrible, having the bad people in charge, they got their wish, and they got in Obama a character like. Martin Sheen as Jed Bartlett on the show that was sort of academic, smart, presidential, you know, like Eat proje- dog. <laughs> <laughs> projected the right image and like in, they got their wish and that like the good people, the smart people would finally be in charge. And if you go back and watch the West Wing and you look at these episodes, it's like it telegraphs every single failure and error and just misapplication of power in the Obama years because I think they finally got their chance to play out their dream of being a character on the West Wing and have it run straight into the fucking maw of how politics and ideology actually works in America. Yep. They found out that the person who has the most data at their fingertips and owns the other person uh, in an argument does not win automatically. The other person does not go, oh, you know what? You have a better case. I'm changing my mind now. It's not actually a debate club. Yeah. And like, it's like, it's so deep. I I realized that like, I've seen the whole show before, but watching the episodes again, I realized that there is a, there is, that it is a clockwork universe in that every scene involves two characters having an argument. One character wins. And then in the next scene, they are rewarded for having won the argument. Like something that they want to happen happens because they won the argument. That it's like it's an like absolute clockwork. Like that is the world that it portrays. You win an argument, you get a cookie. Yeah, we should explain that every time there's legislation up on the West Wing, they're like, "All right, it's time to pass the legislation." And what that means is they get three Republicans and three of Bartlett's disgusting staffers in a room, and the Republicans are like, oh, I, don't, "I don't think that public school should be anything but an aircraft carrier." <laughs> and one of Bartlett's staffers goes, "Sir, 
You were born in a government hospital. You were educated in public schools. You work for the damn government. Why are the people who depend on government always so big on reducing it? And by the way, you son of a bitch, Mr. Rogers went to public school. <laughs> like something, something, something like that. And then the Republican is like, well, I... Uh, uh, he proved he proved his point using my own logic. I, I he guess fires he, his Yosemite Sam yeah, guns in the air. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I guess uh, I, I guess we just have to go into the driveway and do donuts and fire in the air. <laughs> and as, as if Mitch McConnell, like if you beat him in an argument, like if he gave a shit to argue with you, would be like. Uh, 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 we're gonna have universal health care now. <laughs> I w- yeah, I want to talk. I want to go through a couple of the episodes that we saw because it's not going to make sense unless we actually discuss the actual real shit that happens on this show, the actual dialogue and plot points. But before we do, I think we should just briefly break down like the, the characters, like who are the main yeah. cast of characters on the West Wing, and we we can lean on Matt and I, you know, m- early on. But like the West Wing depicts the fictional presidential cabinet of President Jed Bartlett, played by Martin Sheen. And he's sort of like. By the way, he has a he is a Nobel Prize winning economist in the in the in the show in the show. Yeah, <laughs> only because yeah, that's who America funny, can't wait to fucking uh, elect some fucking nerd. Yeah, that's that's my favorite part about Sorkin characters. He can't just make someone like you know an interesting person or like just a witty guy. It's like uh, uh, he can hold his breath underwater for two minutes. He won the Nobel Prize in economics. He invented a new type of laser. They're all Mary Sue's or whatever, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah I, I would be doing this if I didn't have that coke problem. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, and, and Jed Bartlett, you know, he originally wanted to be, become a priest and he went yeah. to Notre Dame and then he met his wife and, you know, he gave up his dreams of the priesthood. But he's sort of like a liberal Catholic, just like the real Martin Sheen. And actually, Matt, you pointed this out, this amazing bit of trivia. Martin Sheen's brother praised President Davison on Decker. Joe Estevez. Yeah. yeah. It's uh-huh. such a perfect confluence. And, and like he on Decker is playing jed bartlett pretty yeah. much like he's th- playing the jed bartlett as seen through the lens of a aggrieved pissed off reactionary dude like uh, uh, I, I don't know decker should we surrender <laughs> <laughs> but then okay then there is uh the press secretary cj played by um allison janney yeah. who i loved actually i have to say she, she i love allison janney and there are some actual good actresses in yeah. this and she is a, a sexy, mean giraffe. She's everything I wanted out of an Alice and Janet character. <laughs> Absolutely. If we're going to talk uh, uh, other other dimes on the show, <laughs> Stocker Channing. Yeah. Oh, Stocker Tell Channing is the yeah. first lady. Yeah, yeah. for Love sure. Stocker Channing. Yeah. And you know, Sorkin also makes sure to write that uh, Martin Sheen's president definitely fucks too. Yeah, yeah. there was a whole well, episode fucks, we yeah. watched where he's just horny. That's he's the B plot yeah. yeah. for the president in that because episode. Because he's it's a not- man in full. <laughs> yes, he's a brilliant economist. Yes, he's president. Yes, he has the weight of the world on his shoulders. But he is also a man. He's horned with manly appetites. Toby, Toby. I would request some time to do my freaking wife. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty much the line of yeah. dialogue. <laughs> Uh, next up, we have his chief of staff, played by John Spencer. Matt, do you remember the name of that character? Yeah, it's Leo McGarry. Leo McGarry, that's it. He former saved his own life. Uh, yeah, former yeah. alcoholic, former labor secretary in a previous Democratic administration. And at one point, when Jimmy Smits is the Democrat who runs after Bartlett's two terms is up, his vice presidential nominee. Oh, okay. Yep. So, which is an insane thing that would never happen. A fucking chief of staff being the vice presidential <laughs> nominee, but never mind. Next up, we got deputy chief of staff uh, Josh Lyman, played by Bradley Whitford. Mm. You got huge yeah. asshole. Yeah, he, yeah. probably he's the most the insufferable character. Rahm yeah, he's the rom. No, character. John Larroquette is the most insufferable guy. He's not like a main character. He's just he's a one on episode. There that much, like though. he's you, the, you watch okay, like but he really sucked all the air out of the room. He really chewed on the scenery. He's very Oberman. If there's an Oberman, like, yeah, he's movie, very yeah. Oberman. He could play it. Yeah, Rob Lowe is head speechwriter, like head of communications. Huge prick. Sam I think he's Seaborn. supposed to be like George Stephanopoulos. Awful asshole. Wait, there's one more character, yeah. and that's uh, Toby Ziegler, played by Richard Huge Schiff. Huge asshole. <laughs> oh, my God, awful. I hate Toby so fucking much because he's the guy who's like the curmudgeon. He's always yelling, but that's because he cares so goddamn much. But what you find out over the course of the show is that the things he cares so much about are bombing the Middle East and cutting Social Security. There's an entire episode halfway through the run where it's nearing the end of Bartlett's second term, and it's all about Toby saying, look, we have a limited time left. 
We have to be courageous. We have to do what's important. We have to do what this country needs. We need a Social Security Reduction Commission. And he spends a whole episode trying to get together a bipartisan coalition to cut Social Security because it's going to collapse. He's a Which, huge shithead and I hate him. He could be one of the most repulsive characters, sort of stealthily the worst one. His They're gr- all pretty bad yeah. from what I saw. And the least annoying is probably Charlie... Uh, who is A, the only black character, and B, a fucking butler, basically, for the president. Oh, yeah. He's please... the least obnoxious, mostly because he doesn't have any, like, shitty policy to to get super self-righteous about. Oh, yeah. Uh, Dulé Hill is that, yeah, Charlie, who's, like, the president's, like, body man. He's the Reggie yeah. the Reggie Love character, right? Yeah. Wasn't that Obama's? Yeah, uh, it was Obama's yeah, guy. It was yeah. his dog catcher? Yeah. <laughs> 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 this is the guy who wrapped Obama's <laughs> turbans. So like yeah, so like that, that's the main cast of characters. It's like you know, it's the West Wing of the White House, and like every day, every episode, it's like you know, they're they're breaking down. Like they're, there's policy, there's procedure, there's you know the ins and outs of government. Walk and talk, walk, walk and, and talk. talk, walk and talk. That was the signature move of the show, and because it's written by Aaron Sorkin, and he left the show around like I think the fourth or fifth season. But he has a he has the writer's credit on all but I think one episode of this show. Uh, someone has told me he gets writer he gets the head writer credit on every single show he's involved with even if other people work on it and he doesn't share credit because it's a way to get royalties for every single episode. Smart. So. It is, by the way, like I, I knew of the walk and talk. I did not know that his entire approach to trying to make a, what was essentially an office place, uh, you know, seem like dynamic and 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 active was just never stop moving the camera ever. You got it's the dolly. Actually, it, Use it. It, yeah, it, it gives you vertigo after a while. It's yeah. insane, and it's ridiculous. Yeah, if you've ever wanted to watch GoPro video of somebody in an office... <laughs> it's like the naked gun intros with the siren. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Going through like a women's uh, shower and like a family's house. Well, that's Gotta a- keep it fast-paced. Gotta keep it moving. Gotta keep it... The country's at stake. Gotta keep it. Every character on this show, like, and every line of dialogue is just, an, is just a stage on which they can demonstrate their superior knowledge of statistics related to OSHA and the Department of Labor or just anything. So to spice it up, it's got to be this, this like, you know, snappy and they have to be moving at all times. And also, as, as Matt shouted at the screen every time it happened, you know, Alice and Jenny's telling John Spencer something in some scene, like outlining a bullet point list of why the policy is good. And Matt, to all these, he knows that. He already knows, they like, this idea know that they're the all... They all know everything they're saying to each other. Every single statistic they're hurling, they know. Yeah. And they got turn on a fucking light once in a while. <laughs> and they're yeah. always in the dark, too. They're literally it's sitting in dark rooms the, dark. the whole time. It's infuriating. <laughs> <laughs> At one point, they're in, a, they're in, like, some weird, I don't know, antechamber full of fucking turn of the century couches and i swear to god the only light is an illuminated china cabinet yeah these motherfuckers it's like they're oh like the days of lincoln oh, we're totally by fire <laughs> <laughs> get so, over yourself <laughs> so basically like the west wing offers a sort of anti-cynical but like it actually is deeply cynical on a certain yeah. level but like not on the surface on the surface, it offers this very kind of optimistic, post-ideological view of government that is essentially like my, my high school self and parents and the people who really like this show got to see their fantasy of what like a good liberal administration would be like and what that would look like. However, watching it now, and like I think we need to get into the actual specifics of this show, shows what a fucking nightmare that actually is. And indeed was, as... It is my thesis that all the people, basically half of the people in the Obama administration were trying to live out the West Wing oh, yeah. over the last eight years or so. Yeah. Hey, every So in the first episode we watched, um, the premise is that a Republican, like sort of pre-Tommy Lahren and Coulter, uh, goes on cable news and debates with Sam Seaborn. And before we get on, the anchor is like, Basically saying what Aaron Sorkin says to every woman, where he's like, "All right, uh, you know, don't don't try to know too much. Yeah. Uh, you're on your period, by the way. Uh, <laughs> you can't do math, you dumb bitch." And, and then she and he's then he goes, "By the way, 
uh, Sam Seaborn has wiped the floor with everyone we've put in front of him. Like it's the UFC. <laughs> <laughs> like anyone's t- keeping score or paying attention or caring. I mean, anyone who has watched a single minute of cable news knows that those debates are just j- jackasses yelling at each other, like basically spitting talking points back and forth. Nobody's Nobody who didn't agree with one side uh, doesn't has changed their opinion. It's just noise. It's kayfabe. Yeah, and, 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 and it, yes, it, it's kayfabe. And at the end, when the cameras turn off, they say, oh, that was fun, and shake yeah. hands. Yes. And and these people think that doesn't happen. Right. No, like, I think, like, the the, the, the anchor character on, like, you know, the, the fictional, like, Capital Beat, you know, talk show or whatever. Capital Beat. Might as well have just said, like, uh, good luck, Ainsley, but... Sam is ten to zero against conservatives, you <laughs> yeah, know. Like, yeah. and it, it, like I'm just imagining Aaron Sorkin watching these cable news shows and just like scoring it like a baseball game, yeah. and thinking like that the the result at the end of the day will equal power, policy, and influence. What does it, in that yeah. universe? Yeah. Because well, here's here's the thing. Like, it begins in a so so super ultra cocky Rob Lowe is going to go on Capital Beat and debate. Uh, the blonde Republican who's sort of like very green. It's her first time on TV. Her name is Ainsley Haynes. And she, in the first, her first lines of dialogue, she talks like Foghorn Leghorn. <laughs> then name, it goes away. Then it goes back. Yeah, yeah. Her name is Anus Haynes. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I'm just a, I'm just a small town conservative pundit. So she's so, thumbing suspenders. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like they're, they're supposed to talk about education policy. And like Sam gets at a good clip and he's just like, you know, Kids are missing textbooks. 300,000 kids in Oregon alone need a 20% increase in textbooks. Are you trying to tell me that Republicans don't want them to have textbooks, Ainsley? And then she's like... She takes the straw out of her mouth. Yeah, like, yeah. I'll tell you one thing about book learning. <laughs> <laughs> so then like, it seems like she's going to fuck up. But then... Oh, this is what we call an old school a reversal because <laughs> she absolutely dunks on him and just like, you know, rat a tat tat, just fires off even yeah. more stats and even more logic at him. And he's trying to get a word in edge. Uh, Inslee, I, yeah. uh, and she just doesn't let him get a word in. And then at the very end, she's just like, well, I may be a Republican, but I know that Eric Town is in California, not Oregon. And it's like, oh, shit. Yeah. I mean, that was so funny because that's how so many of these debates end. Because he wants so badly, Sorkin, to have a clear winner, to have somebody who is the champion of debate. And the and it, that's hard to do because like these are often irresolvable issues. And, exactly. And it's right. hard yeah. to like, have a, 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 a definitive winner. So they always have one of these people who is otherwise shown to be unimpeachably brilliant yeah. just be a complete dipshit about one point. And then the other person owns them on that, and then they walk away winning. And it's just he has to he has to basically like kneecap one of the members of people in the debate in order to get the clear winner that he needs to reward in the next scene. And and during like while the Capitol beat is going on, it cuts to the West Wing, and as Sam is like choking on air, Josh gathers everyone. He goes, "Hey, everybody, come quick! Sam's getting his ass kicked by a girl," and everyone's like. You know, chittering and chattering, yeah. and they're like, "Oh, this is so great! Yeah, so, yeah. We love to see our guy get embarrassed on right. TV." Yeah, by, right. you know, he's only the head of White House communications, and he's looking like an absolute dick on yeah. national television. Yeah. But yeah, you know, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. It, it's the funny thing in the Sorkin universe is everybody talks exactly the same. It doesn't matter yeah. if if you're just like a far right nationalist psycho, you'll still be like, "Oh, and by the way." 34,000 uh, FEMA camps are being developed. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Where is that earmark in your budget, Mr. President? Yeah. That's how yeah. Alex Jones would talk in the yeah. show. That's, oh, and by the way... I you... was actually going to suggest that we do a West Wing Alex Jones. <laughs> oh, if and, we pull up a script, we could do it. Oh, and by the way, President Demonic Goblin, <laughs> uh, last, time, last time I checked... The Third Amendment means that I do not have to quarter troops in my domicile. So... <laughs> Why don't you take and why don't you go to your local library before the homosexuals overrun? <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, the the a plot on this episode is that the president Jed Bartlett, you know, sees this clip of Sam getting his shit pushed in by this like smart, brainy, hot Republican, and is just like tells his chief of staff Leo, let's hire her. Yeah. I was so impressed by this 30 seconds of her that I saw in cable <laughs> news and the three op-eds of hers that I've read. I really like the way she thinks. I like the cut of her jib. We need to be challenged. 
She is morally and like existentially opposed to everything my administration wants to do. But I want her on my, on this team. But, get but her people in here. praised Obama for that reaching yes. across the aisle shit yes. the yep. entire time. And it's like, you idiot. Yep. You're playing to win. And then what does she do? Does she take her newfound celebrity and cash it in to be a $5 million a year talking head on Fox News? No, she takes $40,000 a year job in the basement of the White House. Why? Because she loves the country. She has a sense she of feels duty. like she has a duty yep. to help it make it great. They appear to- working with people who she has fundamental ideological opposition to. Yeah, by the way, because we were high and they kept saying the word duty over and oh, over. Was we, we, I wasn't even high. I yeah, you weren't even high. Quite we just, silly. It was very funny. We have uh, uh, brought to announce uh, that we have hired uh, Marine Le Pen. <laughs> Let, let me be clear. We may disagree on the humanity of Algerians, but we both love democracy. Now, uh, I have to have dog zero. It does tick me off when she draws the Prophet Muhammad, but <laughs> that is her right. It's the Prophet I was raised to worship. <laughs> so... Another thing I loved in this episode was that Ainsley goes back to her like Republican frat house or whatever, and they're like, I'm going to love watching you own these libs every day on cable news <laughs> yeah. for the rest of your yeah. life. High five, Anus. Woo, woo. And, and then she's like, yeah, like, can, can you believe it? Like, ha, ha, ha. And then like she goes to the White House for the job interview and is like very indignant. She's like, I can't believe it. This administration, the things that are better than everyone, and just they, they believe in the Bill of Rights, except for the Second Amendment. And it just goes on and on at this clip of things. And then they're just like, okay, all right, fine. You're, you're again, like we said, 100% opposed to our entire agenda. But the President of the United States is offering you a job in the White House. Yeah. And she's like, I can't turn that down. I mean, that sounds dumb as shit, but I, I mean, fucking... Obama is dumb as shit or was dumb as shit or had no sense of, of fucking... He was always doing that shit. I mean, like, not to that extent. But, like, this idea is like, well, we have to entertain their ideas. In yeah. the campaign, too. It yeah. wasn't, like, something that crept in like a lot of other shitty things did during his administration. The campaign... No, the beginning. He said, like, there's no right America, left America. You know, the whole the whole soup of, like, wanting everyone That's to... That's the speech that got him famous. Yeah. And mm. that yeah. was the speech that made every Democrat in America fall in love with him. Yeah. And it was said at the 2004 convention right at, as the West Wing was, like, ending its run. Mm -hmm. Like, you couldn't get a more direct relationship between these people being, like, fed this horse shit and then a figure emerging to embody the very horse shit that they have been fed. I mean, that speech was probably written by Aaron Sorkin. But yeah, it, it could have been. It you should uh, been. Uh, read the part about um, the thing with the quote, like, there are smart people. Yeah, hold on a second. Let me find this. The, but I, while Will's finding that, that, that entire... That entire there's no left or America, there's no right America. There, you know, we have to hire these people that are diametrically opposed to us because we all want the same thing, even though we don't, is so perfect for what liberalism is now because it's a very moralizing hierarchical system, as the West Wing is. There's a rigid hierarchy. Women are always getting put in their place. People are owning each other all the time. The guy on top is literally the perfect human being. It's incredibly moralistic. People go off on these Oberman-esque, unbearable screeds about just dog shit. But it's also devoid of any ideology. It's the adulation of power. So I want to actually read, go back to Luke Savage's article, Matt, because he speaks directly to this. He says, uh, seriousness is the superlative quality in the Sorkin taxonomy of virtues. It implies presiding over the political consensus, tinkering here and there, and looking stylish in the process by way of soaring oratory and white-collar chic. And now he quotes a line from Toby Ziegler. This is from Season 3, Episode 14 of the show. And man, like I said, if this isn't, doesn't predict the 2016 election, I don't know what does. This is when uh, Bartlett is running for re-election. Toby Ziegler says, make this election about smart and not. Make it about engaged and not. Qualified and not. Make it about a heavyweight. You're a heavyweight and you've been holding me up for too many rounds. That perfectly encapsulates the attitude of Hillary Clinton's entire campaign yep. and the people who still are angry about like the fact that she was, quote, the most qualified candidate ever to run. This is Aaron Sorkin talking to you when you hear this shit. And that was in a scene, right, where it's about to be the, the final debate or whatever, like literally a presidential debate. Is that correct? Yeah, no, that's mm -hmm. the thing. Okay, so 
All right. All right. So when <laughs> they have uh, they have Bartlett run for re-election. I think that was like I don't remember the year. It was sometime around like 2002 or something like that. He ran against James Brolin playing the governor of Florida as George Bush, a dopey, malaprop, riddled kind of lunkhead who talked about fancy elites and how he was one of the people. And uh, running into the last debate, they're like neck and neck. And then there's that speech that Toby gives, and then they show the debate. And it starts with uh, the the question is that's in the air is, is he going to be too know-it-all? Is he going to be too smug? Is he going to try to be folksy? And the first thing he says is he just owns the shit out of the dumbass governor of Florida. Everybody goes crazy. Josh Lyman actually yells, game on. And then the very next episode is election day. And it is a obscene blowout. They win like, they win by like 200 electoral votes. They win like Montana and Louisiana and shit. They just destroy him. Why? And it's directly explicitly argued in the show because he was smarter than him in the debate. Like anything in debates matters, by the way. It, Look at what just you, happened uh, in this uh, election. Trump three <laughs> debates shitting himself. Yeah, yeah. Like, Remember the little Hillary head wobble when she's like, I'm winning. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Trump, yeah. Trump is just up there like, I love Geraldo. I've met him many times, <laughs> and people are like, "Yeah, this is fine." Well, this is what we were we talked about like when we were watching this show over and over again. Like I said, I had to stop watching this show when George W. Bush was president, but it is so much funnier now to watch this shit and these people <laughs> be lionized and held up as like this is what government should be. Now that fucking yeah, like you said, Matt Grimace and the Hamburglar are literally <laughs> roaming the corridors of the White House. Yeah, they should. Sorkin should be forced to rewrite this show with the current White House, <laughs> and it's just like Michael Flynn and Jason Miller just hissing at each other in the hallway. You're a fucking cuck. Yeah, I'm a solid six inches, six <laughs> inches above average. <laughs> Fuck you. But they're roaming a hallway briskly. Yeah, yeah. Say it. yeah. yeah. Well, like, not, not Bannon. Bannon. Bannon is like wad- waddling. <laughs> Bannon's like, Bannon is on the seat. Feeling, leaving behind a slime tray. Yeah, okay. yeah Bannon just falls out of closets and <laughs> he's like with a bottle just with three X's on it. <laughs> and he's like, ah, it's a Hiberian brain pan. <laughs> Bannon is spinning on the ceiling like Baron Harkonnen yeah. going, who controls the white race? <laughs> controls the world! <laughs> Stephen Miller is doing something. He's he's eating clams in some weird way, where he puts the entire <laughs> thing in his mouth and only spits out the top half. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all these freaks. I just want to read one more thing from uh, Luke's piece because I think it really gets to the heart of this kind of post ideological vision of politics that the the West Ring and Aaron Sorkin really proffers. He writes here. It's a smugness born of the view that politics is less a terrain of clashing values and interests than a perpetual pitting of the clever against the ignorant and obtuse. The clever wield facts and reason while the foolish cling to effortlessly exposed fictions and the braying prejudices of provincial rubes. In emphasizing intelligence over ideology, what follows is a fetishization of elevated discourse regardless of its actual outcomes or conclusions." Categories like left and right become less significant provided that the competing interlocutors are deemed respectably smart and practice the designated etiquette. Yeah, well, I I think it really speaks to the idea that the ideological hallmark of neoliberalism is that it believes it is post-ideological. And we spend so little time talking about it. It's just assumed. It's just taken for granted. But it does come from, I think, a very specific text. It comes from... Uh, the End of History and the Last Man, fr- uh, Francis Fukuyama. And uh, he said, uh, if I could just read this short bit, sums the whole fucking thing up. What we may be witnessing now is not just the end of the Cold War or the passing of a particular period of post-war history, but the end of history as such. That is, the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form for human government. Yep. So we figured it out. It's all done. This is our final form. There's no longer any ideological battles. We're post-ideology. It's just, it's just people with problems and we just need to get in a room and hash it out. It's not that we have completely different values. It's not mm-hmm. that we have completely different morals. It's mm-hmm. not that our ethics are diametrically opposed. It's just we need to have a debate 
And it's just about steering the ship, which is clearly going the way it needs to go and will go henceforth. Yeah. You, you can see what a brain worm this is for liberal consciousness when you look at the last election. What was the argument for Hillary? She has the best resume. She's the most qualified. It's this yeah. vision that politics is just the ultimate version of LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, they do. It's LinkedIn with debate club. Yeah, yeah. And if you look at what they're actually arguing about on this show, it really does. It's like you get that late '90s vibe of like, well, what are we actually doing here? Yeah, you know, we are we are just polishing the brass. Like they spend a, a, an episode talking about like ergonomic OSHA regulations. Yeah, they're shit. polishing the brass on the Titanic. Yeah, there, there's also um, one of the last ones we watched. There's some B plot where a Pennsylvania senator has been voted out because of a nuclear test ban treaty or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's the people, the voters in the Pennsylvania election, like every cast member of Banshee, is like, you voted wrong on the nuclear policy treaty. And then yeah, so the setup here is, is it's a lame duck session of Congress, and Toby is doing a full court press to get this nuclear test ban treaty passed. And like the former Democratic senator of Pennsylvania has been voted out. He's always been a, applied because of his support for this test ban treaty with people. Yeah, so people in fucking Fayetteville are really yeah. concerned about. Yeah. Um, Lucas Hood is canvassing <laughs> about it. <laughs> and uh, he meets with Toby and he's like, yeah, you lost a vote. You lost my vote. And Toby's like, what? I, I, I don't get it. You've been a longtime supporter of this and your opponent, you know, is you, you hate him. And he's like, yep, absolutely right. And if he gets on the Foreign Relations Committee, I pray for all our souls, but I can't vote I have to abstain on this. I'll do whatever you say, but I can't vote yes on it. And they're like, why? And he goes, because I respect the voters in my state. Uh, oh. They voted against me because of this treaty. So I cannot in good conscience vote for it during a lame duck session, sir. Meanwhile, you have the fucking uh, a st state government in North Carolina, like trying to reduce the number of, of, uh, of uh, judgeships. So that the new Democratic governor can't fill them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It never, and oh they never God. get to, to, to a moral argument either. They're just yeah. like, here yeah. are some facts. Well, here's some other facts. Well, here's some other facts. They're never like, what you want is evil. People will be sick. People yeah. will die. The morality is saved for the meritocracy points. The meritocracy well, it, and the reverence of authority. It's yeah. the only yeah. thing they believe in. And it's, norms and tradition. It's this liberal fucking obsession with with power. They, they're they obsessed with it. It's the only thing they respect. It's their God. And that type of adulation of power that Amber just mentioned, you see how, how ill-equipped it is once the pretty long reign of general power that the Democrats had in the American system ended. And then as soon as they really do slip, their ideology and their mythology has there's no there's nothing in the toolbox to actually get them to achieve power again or seize yeah, it again. Yeah, they just fucking what, double down on that's this. That's what's fantasy. so weird. Yeah, they just become more and more pious about this like horrible bureaucratic <laughs> process that they suck at and don't know how to win because they have no actual moral backbone. They were only equipped to to in, keep inheriting it. But yeah. then as soon as they lost it, they had no ability to think in terms of how to get it back. That is, that is such a good point. Because they're fucking losers. Yeah, and that, they're and that's born what, losers. And that's what's amazing now watching this show 20 years on is that the mythology of these people, hasn't, like you said, it hasn't been updated at all. Yeah. It's exactly the same as yes. the West Wing, when it, like I said, which came out in 1999. Yep. And like, you know, and that 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 general power they had, it was declining all the time. Right, they weren't really aware of it as much as they should have been. No, because they were polishing the brass on the exactly. fucking Titanic. Well, like exactly. you said, as their actual political power decreases, their self-image as yeah. Josh Lyman, Sam Seaborn, Jed Bartlett types yeah. only becomes more and more intense. Yeah, and I think we saw that in the 2016 election. Yeah, which. Disastrously, the Clinton campaign did try to make about qualified or not, yep. smart or not, mm -hmm. and they paid for it. And now we're all paying for it right now. But like, here's another great example from the show about like, uh, like the like the Pennsylvania senator of like these these things that happen, like these conflicts that come up and then are instantly resolved through goodwill or just respect for American institutions. On one of the episodes, there's a general. 
He was a you know a cigar chomping you know oh, hard yeah, ass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he's he's retiring, but right before he retires, he's going to go <laughs> on the morning shows and slam the the weak national security policies and military defense spending cuts of the Bartlett administration. Like a Democrat would ever do that, <laughs> by the way, <laughs> would ever cut some military spending. Yeah. So, so see, and also like how and even the military at this point is like we have enough things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like IRL, they're like no, so, we got a lot of shit. The CJ, Allison Janney's character, is like, get me that general. Bring him to my office. He calls Allison Janney kitten. That's how you know he's bad. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Listen up, you bitch. (laughs) (laughs) And and first the general sends his, like, you know, aide de camp or whatever. And and Allison Janney's like, who are you? If you're not the general, I don't want to talk to you. And he's like, well, general sent me, ma'am. And, you know, he's just not very happy. And he goes, she goes, you tell general that he's a coward. (laughs) And then he just goes away, and then the general like comes back, of course, because if you call a military man a coward, he's gonna, you know, say it to my face. Yeah, yeah. Say it and to it the, comes say it to back the uniform. And he's like, "You stupid gash, we need enough tanks to stack higher than the Eiffel Tower yeah. he was so like, we can beat France." <laughs> he was like, "I was playing Martha and the Vandellas into Manuel Noriega's compound while you were eating box at Vassar." <laughs> I, 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 I was perforating the rocky seventeen-year-olds who were running away from us. Yeah. Don't tell me about courage. <laughs> and they have this whole back and forth or whatever where she's just like, you know, with all due respect, I think what you're doing is a cowardly move to do this to the commander in chief or whatever. And he's like, I don't respect you or whatever. And then she's like, with all due yeah. respect. Yeah. Because I- she never breaks respect. It's like, you don't need to respect these people. <laughs> so like, th- this conflict isn't resolved. He's like, I'm doing it. And she's like, all right, fine. Like, you know, but like, you know, you're, you've lost the White House or whatever. So you think that like, okay, th- yeah, this show does set up, okay, like this is, let's say this is an intractable political problem, like the entrenched military industrial complex, and let's say a hypothetical democratic president who would like to reform or maybe spend more money on schools and healthcare. It gets to the end of the episode, and CJ goes into the Oval Office with Martin, Sh- with Bartlett, and goes, uh, sorry, sir, you know, General, you know, Buck Turgidson is going to slam you on Meet the Press this weekend. I couldn't get him to stop. And then Sheen just goes, that's okay. Let him say what he wants. He uh, he fought in a war that I wanted no part of. I think he's earned the right to yeah. speak oh, his I, mind on television. I didn't want to go to Granada. <laughs> <laughs> I was too afraid. <laughs> but like, yeah, no, he's talking about Vietnam again. Are we, like, why, like, why is that a good thing? You know what it is? It's when they go low, we go high. Yep. Mm. He's like, oh, yeah. the general, you know, if he's going to go low. He yeah, I earned s- that ear necklace. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. Here's, an, here's another example from the show that actually found a real life uh, analog in the Obama administration. I watched this one today to prepare for the show. But in one of the B-plots, it's Josh Lyman and his Republican friend, who's like a Republican senator or congressman, who's coming to the White House to just talk shop with him. And another one of these, you know, let's sit down and have a beer and hash it out. And they literally yeah. sit down and have a beer at the White House. And the issue they're talking about is uh, gay marriage and whether like there will be mm. federal cover for the, like, you know, Josh is like, look, we already threw it to the states. That's fine. We're just, you know, you don't need federal cover to define marriage is ma- between one man and one woman he, and the guy's like yes we do and this bill's coming for a vote and the president's gonna sign it and then Josh goes but but you're gay and he's like that's right and I'm a Republican and I believe in the Republican <laughs> Party so they have a late night beer summit at the White House and Amber it's exactly what you said like there is no morality here at play it's just like it's just this this intellectual chess match where like you know uh, at no point does Josh just say, of course we're against fucking religion. These are people's lives you're talking about, you asshole. Right. And like he goes, the guy goes, I believe in 95% of what my party believes in. I believe in strong national defense, balanced budget, limited government. That's more important than my personal life. And he, he says what is essentially one of the dumbest lines I've ever heard. He, like when J- he asked Josh, ask the question. You, I know you've been wanting to say it this whole time. Just ask it. And Josh goes, how could you belong to this party? Not like, you know, what's it like to be gay? That's weird. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it's like that's the most obscene question is questioning his party or sense of loyalty to the right. party or whatever. And he goes, you know, Josh, all you anti-gun people, I've always wondered, why don't you just join the NRA en masse? Then at the next meeting, you could have a vote. Get rid of guns. <laughs> And I'm like, That's, what? It you doesn't do work that. like that. Yeah. You like, like if black people just join the KKK and <laughs> mass, yeah, <laughs> right. 
Um, and well, they're just I mean, gonna like carpet bag hardcore. I'm pretty sure. No, the, no, no. I'm I'm going Nambla to reform it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the bylaws of the NRA would prevent any such vote from ever happening in yeah. the first place. Yeah. Why would they have Probably. a, why would they have a vote? They would just uh, not all right. Let you in the NRA. Yeah. All, all right, this is our annual ceremonial vote. Do we take away the guns or keep them? <laughs> I don't know why we do this, but it's predi- <laughs> Charlton Heston actually invented it in the deepest throes of Alzheimer's. <laughs> and we have to respect his wishes. We do it every year. Guns win every year. Sure hope no one enlisted <laughs> in the last minute. Bunch of libs. Uh, and the final hubris of this worldview is that, of course, uh, Bartlett's Tri- triumphant foreign policy achievement over the course of the show is that he solves the Israel-Palestine uh, conflict. Yes, but yeah. oh because my god, if you have people yeah. in a room together because that's the fantasy it always has been of the people who pretend. Yeah. They think the president is Mary America fucking is some sort of honest broker in the Middle East is that if we just get everybody in a room together and just like point out what their really the real interests are, we can get them to to agree to something that's mutually beneficial. And of course, if you believe that, you're going to create a world where Jet Bartlett can roll into Mesopotamia and be like, hey, what's all the fuss and fighting about? Have you guys, uh, hey, Hamas, those are some pretty bad uh, uh, post-hoc ergo propter hocks you're using there. And then they all drop their guns and he fixes the Middle East. Matt, like can you explain for, explain to me and to the listeners the, the most incredible plot twist in the show that I never got to? Not even plot twist, just plot point regarding the Supreme Court nomination. Oh, God, it's so good. All right, so uh, at one point, uh, Bartlett has two Supreme Court vacancies. I think, like, one person resign, or retires, and then the other one dies suddenly. So jackpot. And, jackpot. You can reshape the yeah, court for a lifetime. Right. But the thing is, I mean, not really, because he he does have restraints, because he has he's like Clinton and that he has the Republican Senate. So it's like he has to consider the, the desires of the Senate. And he has this, he has his heart set on this firebrand liberal jurist played by Glenn Close. He wants her on the court. But she's a outspoken liberal and they've said they're never going to let her on. And so they give him this list of like more mediocre uh, justices who are not as outspokenly liberal as her, but also not as accomplished or brilliant, but who could probably get confirmed. And he's like, ah, this is ah, this is boring. This is not inspiring. This isn't why I got into politics. But then at some point, I don't know why he shows up, but William Fincher plays this guy who's basically the opposite of Glenn Close and that he is a brilliant, extremely accomplished jurist who's super, super conservative. And there's a scene where they're debating. And, of course, it's sparkling. It's just the, the fucking sparks are flying with all this intellectual firepower. And... Finally, Bartlett makes the decision that he's going to nominate them both to the Supreme Court. And that because he's giving the Republicans a uh, conservative, they will let him put on the liberal. And it's like, it doesn't matter that this guy has insane retrograde views and he would like, you know, masturbate to juvenile executions if he could. He's fucking brilliant. In his insane fascist... uh, opinions are going to be written with such razor sharp prose which is of course what real life liberals always said about Scalia when he was arguing that you should be able you know to like drown your child if you think they're a witch that his fucking opinions were so fucking smart how long was fucking Scalia in the ground yeah it was a while and Obama sort of did the Bartlett and was like Oh well, if I put up a moderate judge and you vote against them, all the voters are going to see right. that you're yeah. just obstructionist. Yep. Yep. And Mitch McConnell was like, mm, "Fuck you!" <laughs> it didn't yeah, matter. Yeah. Yeah. Like he was said, like, "Well, uh, I'm just gonna I'm gonna do it uh, somewhere down the middle, and uh, you know, we're all gonna we're all gonna agree that this will be a nice compromise for all of us." And they're like, "No, we'd like Satan." Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean that going back to the Israel Palestine episode, that's sort of the perfect exemp- example of what a ridiculous worldview there is like you have this one side that's like well we got we got our land taken we're routinely murdered like every few years you just strafe us with fighter jets and blow us up and the other side is like well we're a harsh ethno state that will resort to espionage for population transfer not even like strictly jews anymore just anyone that's white to outbreed the arabs and the idea that like a Rhodes Scholar guy <laughs> comes in there and he's like, "All right, well, you two actually have a lot in common." Yeah, it's just so. Which actually, and don't pay attention to the fact that 
my fucking country is arming one side in this fucking massacre. To the teeth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think that uh, the, one of the reasons that they have this delusion, the show does, is because of its fundamental misapprehension of conservatism. Because most people didn't get to the last season. I fucking watched the whole goddamn thing. And in the last season, Jimmy Smith's running to replace Bartlett plays a, uh, a Latino Texas congressman, not even a senator, a congressman, who kind of upsets a bunch of more establishment figures in kind of an Obama-esque way to get the nomination. And he runs against Alan Alda, who plays a libertarian senator from California who is a admitted atheist and is pro-choice. Also divorced. I don't. Yeah, I guess I don't remember that part. But like, I remember every that, character. The idea divorced. that a Republican Party would ever nominate someone like that is is genuinely insane. And then uh, in the election, it's a very close race, um, and Jimmy Smith just just squeaks it out. He wins Texas. The Republican wins California. Totally reasonable <laughs> expectations. And then in the crowning achievement of the show, the last episode, the perfect cherry. Jimmy Smith decides to nominate his former opponent as Secretary of State. You know that, like in the original draft, they were like, "What if they were co-presidents? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what if, what if, what if President Jimmy Smith uh, takes a special pill developed by the Pentagon to become gay and they get married, <laughs> but it's actually not recognized in California as a compromise with the Republican Party?" <laughs> but yeah, like whether whether it's uh, you know. The Middle East, you know, things of that level of importance or Supreme Court justices or Obama's idiotic beer summit. I really think like contained in the West Wing and the scripts of those shows and those brilliant Aaron Sorkin scripts mm. and the cerebral and witty the is, the, is the codex. It is the algorithm yeah. that wrote the program that created every failure of the Democratic Party and the Obama administration in the 21st century that has led us right back to like we're, we're just full circle at the beginning of the 20, 21st century. Mm. Now we just have another mm. atrocious right-wing government, even mm. more ludicrous than the last one mm. because of exactly the failures uh, that the, this, this about power and the right that this show obfuscated and their just misapprehension of themselves and how like I, their lack of ideology, this idea that Basically, like you said, if you just get two people, smart people in the room together, a solution is usually halfway in between what they actually believe. This idea that there aren't there aren't any like really intractable political problems in our society. And if you're going to use a show or a cultural product product to inform your your entire politics, basically, or at least a lot of these people do, and it includes no points of reference for actually getting power or taking it back or whatever as the west wing doesn't then your resistance when the resistance finally comes along it's going to be what we've always complained about which is dumbledore's army west wing fucking slash fiction right and and just forever well, power ha has been up until this point assumed well they could never do that with trump because he's too he's against good. he's like they would never he would never be cast in like an aaron sorkin universe like he would have been yeah. well and that's his only crime for that's a his lot of people crime. yeah I, I just want to pick up on one thing that maybe will segue into um a reading that we could do which is just the actual style of his prose or whatever his writing which is so incredibly bad like if this were an actually like snappily written show even if it was diseased, its politics were diseased, that'd be one thing. But he has just basically three tricks, which is like the witticism, repetition, where like... And Rob, vertiginous camera work. And the camera yeah. work. So like Rob Lowe gives a memo or something to Ainsley, whatever. Talk and then, about a guy who's had camera work problems. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then she rewrites it. And then he confronts her later and he goes, you rewrote my position. And she goes, well, I think that it reads a little bit better. And he's like, but yeah, it does read better. And you rewrote my position. And she goes, well, we can try to, to, to triangulate. And he goes, we can try to triangulate because you rewrote my position. And she's like, <laughs> thinks that this is like wit or just sort of this. this his Girl Friday kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Every scene is the same bag of tricks. It's terrible. Right? You know, yeah, he cribs a lot from that. And the other word that we didn't quite talk about it, but I think it's worth bringing up, the sort of the, 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 the way he writes women is very odd. Yeah. 
in that like they're like CJ is the one that's sort of immune to it. And actually, I think she's probably the best character on and the Alice show. And Jenny's performance. She's the best actress. She's she's how the bad best it is. actor yeah. on the yeah. show. Period. Yeah. We love her. Big fan. Yeah, big but fan. like the thing is, like all the other female characters on the show are like. They're, again, highly competent, highly smart, but they're also very girly in a very specific way that seems almost out of date. Right. Yeah. yeah. Look at this dress. Do you see how I'm dressed? Yeah, yeah, there, yeah. There, there are multiple. The one who isn't the other one yeah. at one point. Yeah. And, and she, like, like, all... she's, she comes in the office in a fucking evening gown and she's like, I'm going to return it when I'm done with the date. And it's like, I'm just a girl trying to pinch a penny. And I have to get out of work so I can go on my date. And the, the relationships to all of the male characters are also all, always very subservient and kind of like they're in, almost in these like, yeah, secretarial or sort of valet roles that are there to be sort of teased and needled by the guys in the room. The, the Sorkin vision of the perfect woman is a mom that you fuck sometimes <laughs> and reprimand to show how smart you are, but maybe one time she gets you back, but then you fuck her. Uh, m- multiple times in the show, female characters just have what I can only describe as sort of hysterical breakdowns because they have to do too much work. I mean, the because Alice and Janie. Humors. Yeah, the Alice and Janie character, who's like the most like together, like no bullshit, you know, actually witty character. Like at one point, like when they hire Ainsley Hayes, she hates it, which is the correct opinion. But she's like, I'm screaming. I need, I need my uh, laudanum right now. Yeah. I'm in hysteria. And it's like, what do you think women do? Well, that's in all a pathology this? in all of his work. And we should actually do a newsroom episode at one point. I've because seen it's yeah. funnier that than the West Wing. Way it's, funnier. It's funnier, but he I've all never the characters. Oh, so it's, we gotta watch it's, it. it's really good. We'll but, find a drug that works for you. Yeah, please. Yeah. I would like to be included in Molly. That. Yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. Just ketamine. <laughs> uh, but but it's Molly this, and I'm watching the newsroom, feeling like Fogel. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm John Podesta, Jared Fogel. Put Molly in a foot long. She ain't even know it. <laughs> anyway, it's the same in that show. No, it's the same. Like, well, yeah. No, we, I, I'm sorry. We we watch like the first scene of the newsroom, and in it, like, there's like this this yeah. blonde, this this sorority girl. This she, I didn't. Even, the only knew, we know her sorority girl. She gets tagged as such, but she's like, I have a question for Jeff Newsroom. <laughs> Why do you think America is the greatest country in the world? And then immediately he's like, America is not the greatest country in the world. We are 39th in education, 57th in child yeah. mortality. That's behind Estonia, by the way. <laughs> 86 in internet speed, 95th in clean water. So, you stupid bitch, next time you get your period, instead of putting a fucking page from a book up your fetid cunt, try reading that using a tampon instead. Go fuck your vapid football player boyfriend, you piece of shit. <laughs> Slight exaggeration, but I could uh, really. That's what it is? I could really. Jump I want to watch this show. No, no, we, we have to watch <laughs> it, but but we shouldn't get to. We shouldn't uh, uh, reveal all the the secrets of that of that yeah. different project. Yeah. I, I, Tuck that away. Yeah, well. it's it's super funny, but yeah, and 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 his even the women who are strong willed in that as well, like in the West Wing, they need Papa Bear to come and help them out in the clutch. Like and like all the time. men. Well, the- they, I mean, I, I think you're right that there is kind of a weird Oedipal thing going on. However, again, they've misjudged how people uh, interpret uh, the mother who stands by while they're idly abused by the father. <laughs> like, that's the thing. If the Republicans are the father and the Democrats are the mother, people grow up to resent yeah. the chain-smoking yeah. mother who sat there and ignored Lucille you getting Blue. the shit beat out of you. Yeah. Like, more than they hate the father, mm-hmm. which is what we're dealing with now. Yeah. <laughs> they fear the father. And yeah, they resent the but mother. they resent the mother. Um. And like the other thing is like every man in the White House, including the president himself, is like way too into the like personal and dating lives of their female coworkers. Oh, it's sexual oh, harassment. At one point, like like the president just sexually harasses Alice and Janney, like asks her really personal questions about some guy who is frankly she's way yeah yeah way hotter than it's a press secretary or it's it's a reporter and she like has some try like dance with him he's like you're trying to b- bang this dude or uh, what's, <laughs> that, what's that, going yeah, on yeah and it's I, just like that's sexual harassment that, yeah. that's the one thing that trump does i don't even do. know who she would report to who's hr <laughs> that's the one thing that that's the one thing trump picked up from the show he's like oh I I, yeah oh i'm gonna ask sean spicer who he fucks <laughs> <laughs> 